Hello, welcome to Conscious TV. I'm Ian McNay, and today's guest is Elizabeth Satouris. Hi, Elizabeth. And you've written this book called Earth Dance. I know you've written several other books as well, but you're basically an evolution biologist mm -hmm. and a futurist. And we're going to talk today about where we are as human beings, the human race on the planet, how we got to be where we are, and where we're going in the future, our options. So tell us a little bit about how you were when you were young. I gather you had a very inquisitive mind. Yes, I was uh, free to run around in nature as a child uh, without any grown-ups telling me what it was about, to experience it on my own, on the banks of a river, in the forest, walking on mud flats, uh, collecting various animals, and uh, just a wonderful immersion in nature that made me very curious about who are we people in relation to this natural setting and where did we come from, where are we headed, as you just said. So I wanted to study science from the beginning, but in those days, um, parents said things like girls uh, should study arts and music and languages and things like that. So I actually got a fine arts degree before I became a scientist. And then when I was no longer under the influence of my parents, who thought science was a boy's subject, <laughs> I did go into science, and I was immediately drawn to biology and evolution biology because that helped me become a deep pastist. And I think it's important to understand our past trajectory on this planet if we want to head into the future consciously. Okay, and then I think there became a point where you didn't quite buy or you didn't agree anymore with a traditional view that was put on put out by biologists. Yes, I, I was uh, trained as a traditional Western scientist and therefore in the world view of Western science in which physics is kind of the king science and then biology is a second-rate science, the next one in line, that has to fit itself into physics models. And as a result, biology was very Newtonian, even though physics had gone on and studied quantum physics and consciousness and things like that, biology was still trying to catch up and to this day is in a very mechanistic mode, meaning the metaphors for everything alive is in terms of mechanisms, the mechanism of the genome and the mechanism of this and that in physiology. So what actually, I think there was some yeah. point where you actually felt that consciousness is part of the, of the picture. What was the kind of the catalyst for that? Yes, it, it was a, a matter of kind of feeling that science had become a suit too tight for me. I was supposed to think in these mechanical terms and I was very interested in the mind and, and uh, I was influenced by Jane Roberts' books, the Seth material in the late 60s and 70s. Um, the idea that we create our reality through consciousness and science had no use for that at all. So for a while I actually gave up on science. I had the opportunity to meet Henry Miller and we had wonderful conversations uh, about how he hated the straight line, for instance. And what he meant was he didn't like this tight suit of mechanics imposed on life. We were creating all our human institutions to run like smoothly oiled machines big contest between the, the capitalist West and the Soviet Union about which one had the model for the perfect machinery of society. So science had these offshoots in society itself, and society was in trouble. We were beginning to recognize our unsustainability, the Cold War raised problems, the poverty raised problems, and I wanted to be the kind of scientist who could deal with broader problems, not just the tiny little things you could study in very controlled ways in laboratories. Yeah, I think one of the people that also influenced you was uh, James Lovelock, wasn't he, with the Gaia theory, how everything fits together. So the Earth is a living being in itself, and we're part of the Earth. And so it's very logical that somehow what we do also influences the future of the Earth. Exactly. He was a very holistic thinker, and I first ran into his work when I was doing my postdoctoral fellowship at the American Museum of Natural History. 
and uh, which was a great place for an evolution biologist. At that time, I was studying comparative brain evolution. And suddenly he came out, this atmospheric scientist, uh, with this theory of the Earth as alive, and it just immediately resonated with me. So not long after that, I gave up on science. I went off to Greece to write novels. Uh, it right. was, to me, okay. it, Greece looked like the planet from afar. You know, the beige islands in the blue sea looked like actually the new photographs of Earth from space. And I thought, well, I'll explain the human condition to myself uh, in this way, by writing novels about it. And then found I still wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to be a biologist. I walked in the forest on my little island, and a walking stick fell on my arm. I hadn't seen one since childhood, big stick insect. And it, I, tears just poured out. And I said, I still need to explain this planet and how it works to myself. So inspired by Lovelock and Margulis, I decided to write my own book of the story of Earth as a living entity, as a living planet, and then our human role within it historically. How did we see ourselves in relation to nature over time? Where did that bring us and where could we go from here? And there's remarkable parallels, isn't there, between the evolution of the Earth and the evolution of us as a species, as, the human be as, as a human being. Yes, what I found was that uh, Darwinian theory didn't give me the whole picture. There was part of the picture about this competition in nature, uh, and that fit into a very depressing worldview on the part of science, which was we live in a meaningless, purposeless, material universe. It's running down by entropy, and life is an uphill struggle against this slow demise, but in a, eventually life too gets washed away. So uh, why was life just a competitive struggle for existence on the way to its own demise? Didn't make sense. Well, then I discovered that in the Soviet Union, they were teaching Kropotkin's theory of evolution through cooperation. And I said, hmm, isn't that interesting? We always, as humans, have to decide, are we a radical or a conservative? Are we an evolutionist, uh, Darwinian, or a creationist, or something? But here were two evolution theories that, when you put them together, showed something very fascinating. And that is that there's a kind of cycle of evolution in nature where young species are feisty, creative, and highly competitive, bumping off their enemies as they see them, taking all the territory they can get. And actually, uh, Ecologists call this a type 1 ecosystem made of feisty competitive species. Now, a type 3 ecosystem is made up of highly cooperative, intensely interwoven species. And they say these are different kind of species. And I asked, how did they get that way? Where did they come from? It's actually the type 3 is called a climax ecosystem, and the type 1 a pioneer. So there's a sequence implied, isn't there, from pioneer to climax. And yet they do not see it this way, different kind of species. So I reasoned, maybe it's the young pioneer species that compete until they discover the advantages of cooperation. It is energetically cheaper, more efficient to feed your enemy than it is to kill them. So that they mature somehow concept. and they come to yes. something that it makes sense. It, it was a maturation cycle. Then I discovered through Lynn Margulis's work that the most primordial archaebacteria, the first living inhabitants of the living earth, uh, went through exactly this cycle. For millions and millions of years, they were feisty, competitive, creative, invented the first World Wide Web, of uh, DNA information so exchange. That. So how did they create the first World Wide Web? 